Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the webinar today. I'm Margaret Flowers with Popular Resistance, and we're going to get started in just a few minutes. Um, I'm going to get. I want to give a couple of minutes for people to uh, get set up into Zoom because sometimes that can take a minute or two for that to load up. Uh, we are live streaming this. Oops, can you turn that down? <laughs> Sorry, we're trying to get our technical issues resolved here. Um, so we are going to be, we are currently live streaming on Facebook and YouTube. And so if you have a Facebook account and you're on your computer and that's open, if you would like to share that link out, it's at the Popular Resistance Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash popular resistance org, facebook.com slash popular resistance org it's also live streaming on youtube at youtube.com slash popular resistance org so we appreciate everybody being on the call this saturday afternoon or wherever you are it might be a different time here on the east coast but it's the afternoon so we'll just get started in about one minute Okay, it looks like the number of people coming on has slowed down. So why don't we go ahead and get started. So welcome to the webinar on regime change and climate change connecting the dots. I really want to thank the panelists for putting this webinar together. And particularly, I would like to thank David Schwartzman for coming up with the idea of doing this important webinar. Um, the, the panelists today are Laura Steichen. She is from the Institute for Policy Studies. And she's going to be covering the primer that she co-authored with Lindsay Kashgarian called No Warming, No War, How Militarism Fuels the Climate Crisis and Vice Versa. Then we'll hear from Quincy Saul, who is a co-founder with Joel Covell of Ecosocialist Horizons. He's going to be speaking about the importance of ecosocialism in Venezuela's Bol Bolivarian process. And then finally, David Schwartzman, the co-author with his son Peter, of the earth is not for sale, a path out of fossil capitalism to the other world that is still possible. He will speak about the oil reserves in Venezuela and Iran in relation to U US regime change agenda and climate change. After these presentations, we'll have a question and answer period. We are gonna keep this to a, a hard 90 minutes. So I apologize in advance if we don't get to everyone's questions. There is a Q&A feature on this Zoom platform. So if you scroll your cursor to the bottom of the screen, you should see down there an icon with two uh, little voice windows called Q&A. If you click on that, then you can type questions into that. If you're watching us on Facebook Live or on YouTube, you can also type your questions into the comment sections of those live streams and we'll also have access to those questions as well. So why don't we get started? I'm uh, Dr. Margaret Flowers. I'm the co-director of Popular Resistance. I'm also a member of the Embassy Protection Collective, which protected the Venezuelan Embassy in Washington, D.C. last spring from a coup. And I visited both Iran and Venezuela last year on peace delegations. So the 2020s, in, in my view, and our view at Popular Resistance, is a time of great crisis and also of great opportunity. We've been saying for a few years that the decade of the 2020s would be a time when a lot of crises would come to a head, thinking about things like the climate crisis, the decline in US uh, domination of the world, growing poverty and wealth inequality in the world, environmental destruction, so many issues that we're facing. Uh, today. Uh, we have with the climate crisis really just a brief window to address this in, an, in a serious way so that we can try to mitigate and adapt to some of the impacts of the climate crisis. Um, and we also thought that, you know, the 2020s when we were talking about it, we thought, well, you know, 
it's during that decade. We have some time to prepare for this, but none of us could have imagined that as soon as 2020 began, we were faced with a global pandemic and a global recession at the same time, both of which have really exposed a lot of the failures of the systems in which we live. So out of crisis comes opportunities for transformational change. And if the pandemic has taught us one thing, it's taught us that we are actually capable of making rapid changes when we need to. Uh, we are staying home, those of us who are able to do that. We are taking measures to not spread the disease to our families and people in our community. We're organizing mutual aid to help each other. And we're not traveling as much as we used to travel. All of these are big changes and disruptions to our lives. What type of changes come out of the crises that we're facing really depend on um, who has the power to make those changes. And we know that as usual, the ruling class is trying to use these crises to push through their agenda of more neoliberalism and austerity. And uh, we've just seen all kinds of things from the Trump administration weakening regulations on uh, EPA protections of the planet, uh, taking steps to uh, charge rent to renewable energy uh, so that they can pay off the oil companies. There's just all kinds of things that they're trying to do. And so, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting time where countries around the world are calling for a global ceasefire and international solidarity to address the pandemic. And what we see from the United States is more military threats and more unilateral coercive economic measures against countries like Iran and Venezuela, which prevent them, despite what the politicians and administrations say, prevent those countries from being able to have access to necessary foods, uh, medicines, and you know, goods, supplies that they need for their healthcare and for their infrastructure. And so these illegal unilateral coercive measures or sanctions as they're often referred to, um, do have the impact of killing tens of thousands of people around the world. In Venezuela alone, a report by the Center for Economic Policy and Research found that 40,000 Venezuelans, uh, the, the sanctions contributed to the death of 40,000 Venezuelans in 2017 and 2018. So um, sanctions do kill. And, um, and it's the same situation in Iran. Today, we're gonna focus on Iran and Venezuela. And we couldn't have predicted when we put this uh, webinar together that this weekend, there would be a major conflict brewing in the Caribbean. So right now, there are five Iranian tankers on their way to Venezuela with oil and other necessary supplies. Um, and the United States has also sent um, its military to the Caribbean surrounding Venezuela and has vowed to stop those tankers from reaching Venezuela. Uh, the first tanker, Fortune, is set to arrive in Venezuela tomorrow and the Venezuelan military right now, the Navy is on their way to meet that ship and escort it into Caracas. So um, what happens this weekend uh, is, you know, anybody's guess, but it's a very scary time for all of us thinking about the ramifications of what a conflict between the US, Iran, and Venezuela would mean, particularly knowing that Venezuela and Iran both work with other major, major global superpowers, Russia and China. And so this type of conflict could have really huge ramifications. Um, I wanted to talk just quickly a little bit about Iran. Um, because this is a country that had a democratically elected secular government in 1953 under Mohammad Mossadegh, which the United States overthrew and replaced with the brutal U.S. ally Shah, which was then overthrown in 1979 in the Iranian Revolution. And ever since then, the United States has been punishing Iran with sanctions, with its support for the Iran-Iraq war in the 1980s, where Iraq used chemical weapons with the help, help of the United States, which continue to have an impact on Iranians today. Um, this has all built kind of a, a move towards a conservative theocratic government and anti-US sentiment. And our continued actions against Iran continue to build that sentiment you know, dropping out of the nuclear agreement, the campaign of maximum pressure, including more sanctions. But still, when I was in Iran, people welcomed us. They were glad to see that we were there. They really want peace and dialogue between our countries. They're a very mature, 
culture and an old culture. Um, they won't give up their sovereignty, but they do want peace with the United States. And it's the same thing in Venezuela. And I won't go into that story because I know Quincy is going to talk about that. And I, I know that I'm running out of time. So in closing, you know, we have more in common with Venezuelans and Iranians than we do with the ruling class. The problems that we face are global in nature and to address them, we need a global solidarity at every level and to build the power to take on the ruling elites and create the kind of world that we want to live in, a world of peace, sustainability, biodiversity, good health, economic security and equity, we have to work together across issues and across borders. So militarism and the climate crisis are two global issues that are deeply interconnected. It's my hope that you come away from this webinar with a deeper understanding of the connections between those issues and also a deeper resolve to unite our movements for peace and a livable planet. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker and that's Laura Steichen. She is the Outreach Coordinator for the National Priorities Project at the Institute for Policy Studies. In that role, Laura produces research and analysis on the intersections of militarism and the climate crisis and supports movement building focused on shifting our war economy to address the climate crisis. Prior to IPS, Laura worked as an organizer, researcher, and writer for the NAACP Environmental and Climate Justice Program. So Laura, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Margaret. Um, I'll let you, I'll, I'll get started while you queue up that PowerPoint for me. Um, but thanks, Margaret. And um, thanks to everyone who's joining us this afternoon. It's great to be in community with everyone and to have this really critical conversation. Um, I'll just get started while Margaret queues up the PowerPoint. Um, um, like. Yep, looks good. Okay, um, so like Margaret said, I work with the National Priorities Project at the Institute for Policy Studies, and we conduct research and produce analysis on the federal budget and military spending. And as many, probably all, who are joining this conversation today are already aware, the U.S. military claims a huge percentage of the federal discretionary budget that Congress allocates every year, while programs that are critical to meeting human needs and keeping people safe get pennies by comparison, um, including programs that we would use to help manage pandemics or to mitigate and adapt to the climate crisis. Um, so today I'd like to share the findings of a new primer that the National Priorities Project released this year on Earth Day, No Warming, No War, How Militarism Fuels the Climate Crisis, and vice versa. Um, in this report, we lay out the ways, like Margaret said, that militarism and the climate crisis are deeply intertwined and mutually reinforcing, and I'll outline those points today in my presentation. Next slide. So climate change and militarism intersect in a variety of alarming ways. Um, the Pentagon is a major polluter. The United States has a well-known history of fighting wars for oils and the fossil fuel industry also relies on militarization to uphold its operations around the globe. Climate change and border militarization are inextricably linked. Overinvestment in the military comes at the high cost of underinvestment in other needs, including climate action, like we'll talk about today. Um, workers really need a way out. We need a just transition for workers and communities in both the fossil fuel and military sectors. And finally, racism and racial oppression form the foundation for the fossil fuel and militarized economies, and neither could exist without the presumption that some human lives are worth more than others. Next slide. Um, sorry if this is a little hard to read. Um, I'm happy to share it with folks after the presentation is over, um, but I'd really like to frame our discussion today within the context of the Just Transition Framework. Many are probably familiar with this terminology and perhaps this very framework that we're showing here on the screen. Um, it comes out of the climate justice movement, and it's a process for transforming an unjust extractive economy, that's the economy we have now, 
that exploits people and harms the planet to a just regenerative economy with healthy, thriving communities and ecosystems. And maybe you can tell um, in this framework under the current extractive economy that militarism is really the coercive arm of the extractive economy. Militarism is really what governs the economy. And people have always um, resisted the exploitation of the extractive economy, but violence and the threat of violence keep this economy in motion. Um, and like we'll talk about some of the other presenters today, this plays out on a global scale. So the military yields this power internationally, increasingly militarized policing, employ brute force against communities within the United States, and immigration enforcement violently patrols national borders at the nexus of the international and the domestic. Next slide. So the first point we make in the primer is that the Pentagon is a major polluter. The US military, as we know, has extensive infrastructure and operations, both domestically and abroad. And so it probably doesn't come as a big surprise to many here with us today that the largest industrial military in the history of the world is also among the biggest polluters. The US military produces about as much greenhouse gas emissions in any given year as many entire industrialized countries do. So it produces about the same amount of greenhouse gases annually as countries like Denmark and Sweden do. Next slide. So the Pentagon is also the world's largest institutional user of petroleum. So just one, for some perspective and scale, just one of the military's jets, the B-52 Stratofortress, consumes about as much fuel in one hour as the average car driver uses in seven years. Next slide. So another sort of well-known fact amongst many in this community is that the United States has a well-known history of fighting wars for oil. Oil is the leading cause of interstate war, and it accounts for roughly half of those wars in re recent decades. And a really significant part of the hundreds of billions of dollars spent on the Pentagon every year goes towards defending the world's oil supplies. So the U.S. military spends at least $81 billion a year defending the world's oil supplies, um, which is really code for protecting global oil supplies from other countries and ensuring access for the use of the United States. Next slide. <clears throat> the fossil fuel industry also relies on militarization to uphold its operations around the globe. So this results not only in war, like I was just speaking of, but it also results in militarized responses to resistance. So all over the world, here in the United States and in other countries, those who fight to protect their land from extractive industries like the fossil fuel industry are often met with state and paramilitary violence. And we know that Black, Indigenous, and people of color are disproportionately targeted by this militarized violence. Next slide. So the data shows that at least three people are killed every week around the globe defending their land and water. And we also know that that count is almost certainly an undercount. Um, indigenous people make up about 5% of the global population, but they're about a, they account for about a quarter of those murdered for defending their land and the environment. Um, we've seen this play out right here in the United States um, with militarized responses to indigenous-led pipeline protests, for example. And these populations of people sort of defending their land from extractive industries are increasingly characterized as eco-terrorists. And so we really see the same language used to justify war and military aggression used to target those who are resisting the domination and exploitation of the fossil fuel economy. Next slide. Another important intersection of climate and militarism is that climate change and border militarization are inextricably linked. We know that climate change is already compounding existing conflicts around the world and causing more political instability. And the result of this is that we are going to see unprecedented levels of 
um, dislocated people. Estimates project that around 200 million people will be displaced by the middle of the century due to climate change. And some estimates project even higher levels of displacement, some as high as 1 billion people by 2050. Um, already between 2008 and 2015, an average of 21 million people were displaced annually from the impact and threat of climate related hazards. So we're already seeing this begin to play out. Next slide. Um, despite the sort of huge looming crisis of climate related mass displacement, we don't really hear the federal government talking too much about this crisis. Um, but the Pentagon has actually been planning for climate migration for decades. Um, they released a report in 2003, for example, that describes the fortressing of America in order to prevent what the report describes as, quote, unwanted starving immigrants, unquote, from the global south from entering the United States. Um, so we see this not only on U.S. borders, but around the globe. Governments are allocating more of their budgets to building walls, to hiring armed guards, and militarizing borders to keep migrants out. Um, here in the United States, where I live, um, this is really important to keep in mind that the United States is responsible for more greenhouse gas pollution than any other country since the Industrial Revolution. And so having played such an outsized role in causing the climate crisis, the United States really bears a disproportionate share of the responsibility to address it, including a debt to displaced people around the globe. Next slide. So proposals to meaningfully address the climate crisis, we all know are often characterized as sort of unrealistic pipe dreams. We've heard, you know, Nancy Pelosi responding to Sunrise activists as, um, you know, their, what is it, the green dream or something, she called it like that. Um, but we know that, you know, this sort of, well, how are you going to pay for it retort, that same scrutiny is almost never applied to military spending. Um, and the reality is, is that there's really no shortage of funds for a just transition to a green economy. Right now, we're spending $700 billion every year on the military in the United States. Um, this year, in 2020, the military budget was 272 times larger than the federal budget for energy efficiency and renewable energy, to put it in perspective. Next slide. So another good comparison to think about the scale of military spending compared to the spending that we have done to address the climate crisis is that we've spent $6.4 trillion on war in the past two decades. Um, in contract, contrast, the cost to transition our national power grid to 100% renewable energy is an estimated $4.5 trillion over 10 years. So instead of spending trillions of dollars on endless wars for the past two decades, we could have already transformed our energy grid and had literally trillions of dollars left over for any number of other priorities or um, other aspects of the just transition that we need. So I think something that's important to keep in mind is that this really enormous level of military spending has really warped our sense of what's possible because too often I think we're tricked into believing that we can't afford to improve our lives or keep the planet livable. And um, we just know that that's not true. Next slide. Um, so finally, um, I want us to think a little bit about labor as it relates to climate and militarism. The fossil fuel and military sectors mirror each other in another way in that workers are frequently funneled into lethal work in both the military and the fossil fuel industry due to limited options. And something that's really critical to this conversation that we need to always include is that workers need a way out. Um, like fossil fuel workers will need to transition into new jobs. There must be alternative pathways for good employment for individuals and communities whose livelihoods are tied to the military. We know that right now the United States military functions as essentially the only major federal jobs program in the United States. Um, but funding the green economy instead of the military budget would actually be a net job creator for the same level of spending 
clean energy and infrastructure create over 40% more jobs and energy efficiency retrofits create nearly twice the level of job creation. Next slide. So really in solidarity with the existing movements on the front lines of US militarism around the globe and climate injustice, um, I just want to conclude with some principles for collective action that can help us sort of guide our cross movement organizing. Those are all human life has equal value. Economies are only as healthy as people and the planet. All people have a right to self determination. There's enough for everyone. And we are all interconnected and so are our movements. So with these principles for collective action in mind, um, we must pursue solutions to the climate crisis that really challenge the violent and oppressive systems that have fueled both war and global warming for generations. And then I think there's just one more slide with my contact info. Anybody, I look forward to you know everyone's questions today, but if folks have other questions, feel free to reach out to me. And there's more information about this primer, which I've sort of fast forwarded through um, and to download the primer and more information on our work, you can visit nationalpriorities.org. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Laura. That was really excellent. Um, so let's go next to Quincy Saul. And Quincy is a writer, musician and co-founder of Ecosocialist Horizons. His publications include Truth and Dare, Maroon Comics, Maroon the Implacable, and the Emergence of Eco-Socialism. His articles appear on Counterpunch, Telestore, Truth Out, and other publications. And he currently works with the Sarbadaya Institute of Higher Learning. He is part of the first Eco-Socialist International. And let me unmute you, Quincy. Take it away, thank you. Thank you so much, Margaret. Can everybody hear me? <clears throat> yes. Okay, fantastic. Um, First of all, thanks to everybody. Uh, thanks to Margaret for setting this up. Thanks to Laura for the presentation. Uh, thank you for David for getting us started. And thanks to everybody for tuning in from all over the world, not only coast to coast in the United States, but even from quarantine camp in Sri Lanka, I see someone tuned in. So uh, great to have you on board on this uh, very important subject, uh, which doesn't even have coronavirus in the title and people are still interested. So very happy to see you all. Um, this is my primitive PowerPoint, uh, so you can look me up uh, afterwards. Quincy Saul, Eco Socialist Horizons, and um, these are my email address and the website you can tune into there. Everybody, see that? Okay. Um, so I want to start off uh, with a rhetorical uh, leading question: um, What is the biggest blind spot of the climate justice movement? all over the world. You could argue that there are maybe a few. You could say uh, racism or patriarchy or even just the issue of militarism itself uh, could be considered as a blind spot. But I have kind of a more practical and maybe more surprising answer to that question. Um, the answer is the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. Um, so just to give you a small background on why I have anything to say about this, I've been traveling to Venezuela uh, since 2013. Um, I'm sorry, excuse me, since 2009. Um, and the last time I was there was 2017. Um, so I've been about five times for a few months each time. Um, I'm not the world expert on it, but I hope I can share some insight from my experience. Um, so why on earth would I say that the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela is the biggest uh, blind spot for the climate justice movement? Um, something about Venezuela, it is the country with the biggest oil reserves and it is the government with the most radical politics in the world. Um, you might not have heard of either of these things. I think it's since 2014 that uh, OPEC acknowledged that Venezuela had larger oil reserves than Saudi Arabia. Um, the second point about the radical politics, you almost definitely haven't heard. Um, let me just go over a little bit about the eco-socialist politics of the Venezuelan revolutionary process. Um, you can say, starting with the plan of the homeland, in 2013, um, which declared Venezuela as an eco-socialist uh, platform. It was Chavez's, Hugo Chavez's last five-year plan. 
Um, and uh, it committed the government in very specific ways that you can read to an eco-socialist uh, pathway. Um, it founded a ministry of eco-socialism. It's about 30 floor building in downtown Caracas, which has um, had uncountable initiatives um, around ecological uh, politics. Um, and most importantly, and what I know the best, there are grass, grassroots movements. Um, this includes um, an anti-GMO movement, an anti-genetically modified organism movement. Um, farmers in Venezuela wrote and passed an anti-GMO, anti-patent seed law in 2016, which they wrote themselves. I think it's the only country in the world uh, which not only has an anti-GMO, anti-patent seed law, but that it was written actually by farmers. Um, there are thousands of people involved in the formation of thousands of eco-socialist communes all over the country, especially in the rural areas. Um, also, you might not have heard, um, Kaura National Park was founded in 2017. It's the largest uh, national park in the world of tropical rainforest. Um, probably you have not heard of this. Um, lastly, I'll say more about this later. In 2017, it was host to the founding of the first eco-socialist international. Now, chances are you haven't heard of any of this. Um, and you can be excused because uh, there is a media war going on. This is why you haven't heard of it. Um, everything possible is being done by every media organ in the world to make sure that you don't hear about one of the world's best hopes. Um, now might be a good time to remember something Malcolm X told us a long time ago, that if you're not careful, the newspapers will have you loving people doing the oppressing and hating the people. Um, I'm sorry, yeah, hating the people who are oppressed and loving the people who are doing the oppressing. Um, this is very relevant in, in uh, Venezuela today. However, uh, suddenly everything went for a spin, right? Suddenly we have COVID clarity. Um, this recent pandemic has really turned the whole media war on its head um, in very interesting ways. You might have noticed a change of tune in the media. Um, who is fighting for toilet paper right now? Um, you may recall that over the past five years, um, this has been a major thing that's being reported in the world press about Venezuelans fighting for toilet paper. Um, I just did a search online and there were articles on this subject. Um, it gives you a sense of the range of the media war against Venezuela. Um, there were articles published about toilet paper in Venezuela by BBC, CNN, Reuters, The Guardian, Atlantic, foreign policy. So it's really across the spectrum of what in the United States people might consider left and right. It's um, the whole, everybody is out um, against Venezuela here. Um, but who's fighting for toilet paper? Well, we know the, the U.S. is now fighting for toilet paper. And what's happening in Venezuela under the pandemic? Well, it's very interesting to see what's happening. Um, there was, was announced in March, six-month policy, um, in which for the next six months, all rent and loans are forgiven. How about that? Um, subsidized food, food much cheaper than you could get in the supermarket, is literally delivered to your house, um, especially if you're a very poor person. Um, work dismissals are banned. Nobody gets fired. Um, if you can't keep going to work because of lockdown, you get paid anyway uh, by the government, and you also get a bonus. Um, 14,000 doctors, or more than 14,000 doctors, um, are now going door to door um, trying, doing testing, helping people out with what they need. And, uh, there are no telecom shutoffs. So if you can't pay your bill, uh, because of the crisis, you will, you will have your coverage through till September. Um, so that's pretty exciting. We kind of all wish we lived in a place like this, don't we? Um, so, um, and, and this is also revealed by their migration. I think since the outbreak began, um, 40,000, about 40,000 people have returned to Venezuela. Uh, you may recall that over a, a couple million people left Venezuela as a result of the sanctions, uh, which were discussed earlier. Um, now they're coming back. Um, uh, suddenly, everybody realizes that uh, health care, uh, life is more important than money. Um, so people are trying to get back to Venezuela um, in large numbers. Um, so there's a way in which we are all Venezuelans now. I mean this in two ways. Um, in one way, it's like the wishful, like we wish we could live in a place where 
the state actually was accountable to its citizens and, you know, had a medical system and a food system that responded to the needs of its citizens. Uh, but I mean this in a more practical way as well, in the sense that um, just something I've seen personally, um, suddenly everybody is very much concerned about their food sovereignty. Never before in human history has the question of food sovereignty uh, been more immediate on the family level. Um, so this is something I've been, I've sort of had a training in crisis over the last five years visiting Venezuela. And it's interesting to see that happening now in other parts of the world. Um, literally everybody I know in Venezuela, from small business owners to students to political activists to government bureaucrats, are all growing food in their windows. Um, and that's something that started, I've noticed, um, in the last couple months um, in all over the world. Um, so there's a way in which... Um, we're all Venezuelans now um, in the sense that we all suddenly are getting a bit of a training in what it means to live under an economic uh, crisis. And um, I think that uh, this is something food for thought uh, and uh, literally. Um, however, uh, this, of course, cannot be tolerated by the powers that be who depend on our continued uh, submission and complacency uh, for the construction of their feudal technocratic, uh, fascist, racist, patriarchal world order. Um, so the subject of our discussion today, uh, regime change, that's what we're talking about because um, some regimes can't be allowed to continue. So there's many regime, there's many words for this. I put four here, uh, regime change, counterinsurgency, imperialism, and neocolonialism. All four of these words can be used to describe United States policy to Venezuela um, over the last couple decades. Um, and in particular, I'd like to point to an unbroken line which has stretched from Bush to Obama to Trump today. Um, there is no discernible change in policy between uh, any of these actors, Bush, Tr Obama, or Trump. Um, they have all attempted to accelerate uh, you know, the regime change agenda. Uh, but uh, it's becoming increasingly desperate. Uh, we've noticed this in recently um, that uh, their attempts at regime change are, are increasingly um, are increasingly desperate. Um, brazen and shameless uh, attempts at coups and assassinations. And if you look at the most recent, like three or four coup attempts, they're all very easily traceable to people operating um, either in directly from the United States or in Colombia through a, you know, a United Colombian proxy through a U.S. Uh, architect. Um, so this is all um, very, <laughs> it's hard to keep track of, but I think the main thing is to notice how desperate it's become to the extent that they've chosen someone like Juan Guaido as their spokesperson, um, a completely unqualified person who just declared themselves uh, president, not even during an election month, not even during an election year, um, and uh, is just making every mistake possible for a, for a politician. Um, and so that's that's very interesting. Um, we've already noticed that there's uh, we've already been told about the current standoff in the Caribbean. Um, it's not just U.S. ships down there. It's also British uh, ships. It's um, Dutch ships as well. Um, so there's like a little world war scenario brewing down there in the Caribbean, all to carry on this con continued um process, uh, which has been many years brewing. Uh, the bottom line, folks, is that Venezuela has the largest oil reserves in the world. And uh, the way imperialism works is that you don't just let that go. You know, you don't let that get taken away by, uh, you know, a, a revolutionary movement. So we can, we will continue to see for sure more uh, crises to come in Venezuela. Um, but in the meantime, it's really, it's not just these three. Um, it's not it's not just the United States. Uh, there's an international campaign about against Venezuela against the revolutionary process in Venezuela and um, and they have names and addresses. Um, so this is time for my second rhetorical leading question. Uh, will the real shithole countries please stand up? Uh, and they have stood up um, in support of Guaido. Um, they have all come out um, against democracy. It's rather remarkable. Um, to, to openly come out against a uh, democratic process and uh, over to, to support the overthrowing of a government. Um, and it's not just support uh, politically. Um, the, for just to name one example, it's economic, one example, um, the British government, the United Kingdom, has seized um, over 31 tons of gold, of Venezuelan gold, 31 tons of gold, estimated about a billion dollar value, 
um, and they're preventing this from being returned to Venezuela. Um, so the real shithole countries, they have names and addresses. Um, here's some of them, you know, uh, chances are you might live in one of these and, uh, it's our job to make sure that the government in these countries changes so that they, uh, don't support, um, an anti-democratic, uh, proto-fascist, openly racist, uh, government taking over in Venezuela. Um, so luckily there is a solution to this. Um, it's not just, uh, the bad guys on the international scene. Um, somebody just note, you needed a spaceship to get to the, out of the shithole countries. Well, luckily in every country of the world, uh, there is an alternative alliance, which has been found, uh, going for some time now. It's called the first eco-socialist international. Um, it was founded in 2017 in Venezuela, uh, with over a hundred delegates from five different continents. Um, look this up online, Google this, and you can download the program of action. It's 20 pages long. It was written by, again, by delegates from five continents, but hosted by the Venezuelan grassroots movements. Um, it's a short, medium, and long-term plan. So it has ideas for today, next year, and it goes all the way ahead 500 years into the future because it took 500 years to get us into this mess, and it'll take another 500 to get us out of it. Uh, this plan combines very urgent things that we can all be involved in from medical militias, forming local medical militias that go door to door to help people, um, the reinvention of education. Uh, it calls for Europeans and Americans to better control their own governments. Um, it calls immediately for support for the original peoples of the world, um, original peoples of the world being defined as both um, African, American and Asian indigenous peoples. Um, specifically, it calls for the construction of um, food gardens, uh, food forests, uh, analog forestry. There's a huge element here that we need to build the new world. Um, it's not just enough to just resist the old one. So I think that this um, program is, is the most holistic, comprehensive program I'm aware, I'm aware of in the world. Uh, and I hope you'll join me in, uh, in reading it and finding a way to take part. Um, and, uh, and to recognize that this couldn't have been founded in any other place other than Venezuela as a result of the decades of uh, revolutionary process which have built up there to a, a kind of a fever pitch of momentum. Um, it's, it's one of the most exciting, maybe arguably the most exciting place in the world for radical politics. Um, and so again, this is something that we should be paying close attention. Um, I think now might be the time to offer just a brief uh, give a shot at a brief um, explanation of what the eco-socialist perspective is. What is the eco-socialist analysis of today's topic, which is the connect connecting the dots between regime change and climate change? So I would say um, that following Joel Covell and others, um, the main connection between them is that um, regime change and climate change are both forms of imperialism. So what do we mean by this? We know regime change, when you go in there with guns or economics, um, you change somebody else's country. Uh, but we also know that, uh, that we know about that being imperialism, but we don't necessarily always think about climate change. Basically, climate change is a result of the uh, industrialization activities of a small minority of the world. It's the same minority that colonized the rest of the world, United States, Europe, and um, these are, and as a result of this 20% of the world's population that's producing 80% of the greenhouse emissions of the world, we are forcing um, drastic climactic changes on the vast majorities of the world's population who did not create this problem. So I think this is one thing we can keep in mind um, that uh, in order to connect the dots between climate change and regime change is that both of these are forms of imperialism and it's not enough to be just against it. You know, um, Amilcar Cabral uh, famously said that, you know, you, we won't defeat imperialism by just shouting insults at it. Uh, we have to actually build the alternative. He quoted somebody, he quoted the saying that when the house is on fire, it's no use beating the tom-toms. Uh, just us discussing the, you know, the, the malfeasance of empire will not bring the empire down. Uh, what's necessary for that is, um, and again, connecting the dots again between regime change and climate change, what's necessary to defeat both of these things 
is uh, revolutionary transformation through collective action um, at every level from the family to the nation state and the international arena as well. Um, and that's why, um, coming to the end here, the article that David Schwartzman and I, who you'll hear from next, wrote um, is the title of which is that the path to climate justice must pass through Caracas. Um, so what do we mean by that? We mean that in order to achieve climate justice, we're going to have to confront the imperialist war machine in the, in the global north in the United States with its British allies and its Dutch allies, uh, which is trying to sabotage one of the world's best hopes. Um, and it means we can come back to this original uh, paradox, which I posed to you here. You can find, by the way, this article um, on uh, Counterpunch and Monthly Review Zine by myself and David Schwartzman for more detail. But to go back to this point, um, that this is the country with the biggest oil reserves and the most radical, pol the government with the most radical politics. Um, mostly, this is not even considered at all. If it's considered, it's considered as like a, as a contradiction, as a way to dismiss these politics. Oh, they have eco-socialist politics, but really they're just drilling oil. And that argument completely dismisses the thousands of individuals and and hundreds of organizations which are struggling um, to not only maintain their revolutionary process, but to advance it. And they vote for the Maduro government. Um, and uh, I think the, the key thing here is that uh, people mostly see the contradiction, but they don't see the hope. Um, look at the hope. Bertolt Brecht said uh, in the contradiction is, is the hope. Um, what other country in the world, I want David can go more into this, but is there any other country in the world that could lead uh, an energy transition? Now we're getting back to our big blind spot question for climate justice activists. How are we going to do this, folks? We need to do an immediate uh, transition to renewable energy on a global scale starting yesterday. Um, and in order to make that transition, we need fossil fuels. We need oil. We can't build solar panels with solar panels yet. Uh, we need oil. So who is going to do this? Is Saudi Arabia going to do this? Is the United States going to do this? It seems very unlikely. So Venezuela is the only country right now in the world that I, that I can think of with really the capacity to kickstart a global energy transition, um, the one that we all need. Um, so I hope that uh, David will say more about that. Um, and I hope that uh, we all can come to the defense of Venezuela and see that as part of our climate activism. Um, because, again, I, I think this is the world's best hope uh, for uh, uh, the transition that we need. Um, I'm going to stop now. Thank you for your time and attention. If you want more like this, uh, please read online. You can read more uh, my April theses with 2020 Vision um, on Counterpunch for more ideas along these lines. Um, you can give me a call. I mean, give me a uh, write me at uh, through one of these. And um, thank you very much for your time and attention. Folks, uh, we're in the portal. Uh, the pandemic is the portal, and we're heading through it right now. Um, and I look forward to seeing you on the other side. The decisions we make, the things we do in the next few months, next few years to come, are going to determine the rest of the century ahead. Uh, so it's a very exciting time, very urgent time. Uh, thank you, everybody, for turning in. And I'd be happy to uh, answer more questions and be in touch. Great, thank you so much, Quincy. Now we'll turn to our final speaker, which is David Schwartzman. He's a professor emeritus at Howard University in Washington, DC. He's a biogeochemist and environmental scientist with a PhD in geochemistry from Brown University. He contributes to his son, Peter Schwartzman's website, Solar Utopia, uh, solarutopia.org. His publications include Life, Temperature, and the Earth, and several recent papers in Capitalism, Nature, and so Socialism. David serves on the CNS Advisory Board and is also the Advisory Board of Science and Society and the Institute for Policy Research and Development. He's an active member of the DC Statehood Green Party and the Green Party of the United States, as well as several other community organizations, especially since his retirement from Howard University in 2012. So David, I'm gonna pull up your PowerPoint now and uh, you can go ahead and get started. One moment. Uh, here it is. Oops. 
Okay, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. And uh, they were great already. I'm following great presentations. Uh, my PowerPoint will not have the elegance of Qu of Quincy's, let's say, and certainly not of Laura's. Um, and uh, you both have covered some of what I was going to talk about. So uh, give me a little more time to emphasize some other points. Uh, by the way, I'm on the editorial board now of Science and Society. I was uh, elevated <laughs> recently. Um, so as Quincy uh, said, uh, Venezuela has the largest proven oil reserves in the world, uh, amounting to about 300 billion barrels. Um, and uh, previously it was Saudi Arabia, but now Venezuela has it. It also uh, has plenty of conventional oil as well. Uh, Venezuela's Orinoco tar sands are significantly less viscous than Canada's. And uh, the Orinoco uh, heavy oil or tar sands are actually constitute most of this reserve. Uh, so the oil, the oil sands there can be extracted using conventional oil uh, methods, giving it a considerable advantage over the North American rival in terms of capital requirements and extraction costs, uh, and which, of course, referring to the tar sands in uh, Canada. So it's important to emphasize that the extraction of this huge reserves would be a climate killer. But defeating the imperial agenda drive that is driving the current uh, regime change agenda and the attempted coup from last year will potentially make an important contribution to global climate security. Venezuela must be left to determine its own destiny, making possible an alternative scenario, which Quincy alluded to, upon which the biosphere, the fate of the biosphere may hinge the most of the oil reserves will stay in the ground, while a small fraction will be used as an energy source for a solar transition uh, led by Venezuela, starting in Latin America, but also contributing elsewhere in the world. While Venezuela's leaders may sometimes uh, brag about their huge reserve, they surely know that most of it must remain in the ground, which is consistent with Venezuela's own ratification of the Paris Agreement, uh, not to mention its own plan of the homeland, recognizing that much more radical curbs on greenhouse gas emission than presently committed are imperative to keep warming below the goal of one and a half degrees centigrade. Can the oil, can the world go 100% wind and solar and keep warming below this limit? That is one of the three, um, above the pre industrial level. Using the fossil fuel with the lowest greenhouse gas footprint, and that is conventional oil. Uh, natural gas actually has the highest because of the leakage directly to the atmosphere of methane. Uh, so natural gas is not the bridge. And here, uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, this was from, a, oh, the one right before that. You skipped over the cartoon. <laughs> this was from uh, Politico from a year ago, and here's Elliot Abrams uh, being uh, uh, launched into Venezuela regarding the coup. Okay, next slide, please. So, uh, the next one I've already covered this. Actually, you could just uh, stop right here, and I uh, and I will. We will share the PowerPoint because I think it may be distracting to go to show all the slides. So, the the uh, recently we have a good estimate of how much the emission budget is remains to keep under one and a half degree how much burnable carbon uh can be how much carbon can be burned and still keep under that limit and it's 
it's actually equivalent to roughly 1,200 billion barrels of oil. 1,200 billion barrels of oil. Uh, even a rapid termination of coal and natural gas would obviously subtract from this burnable oil. But uh, we, the present technology now of wind and solar uh, can reach the goal of uh, going 100% in a renewable transition of roughly 20 years, using only 2% of the present energy consumption per year. Uh, and this would be necessary of a level to eliminate energy poverty that most people in the world suffer from, uh, particularly in the global south, and to have the capacity to mitigate and adapt to climate change even keeping below the one and a half degree limit. So with a, a strong protection regime driven by transnational class struggle, this path forward can be much less ecologically destructive than the alternative, which is climate catastrophe with horrors much worse than we now witness. So Venezuela can lead, actually lead a solar transition to Latin America uh, and using really a small fraction of its uh, conventional oil, which is roughly um, about 40 billion barrels. This is, doesn't include the Orinoco uh, deposit. And we, uh, Quincy and I wrote a paper uh, in Capitalist Nature and Socialism that we'd be happy to share with you uh, from 215 to that goes into the details of how this could be possible. And that's the huge potential that Venezuela has in its uh, eco-socialist perspective. If, they, if Venezuela and the people of Venezuela would be allowed to actually make this possible. And that requires defeating the regime change agenda. But of course, militarized fossil capital has other plans. That is the destruction of Bolivarian uh, revolution and surely uh, being uh, committed to extract this huge oil reserve, regardless of the climatic or environmental consequences. And this was, became uh, clear uh, in an interview on Fox Business. Uh, the Trump's former national security advisor, John Bolton, was very open about the U.S. Uh, attempted coup a year ago being motivated by oil. And uh, he said, we are looking at the oil assets we don't want any American businesses or investors caught by surprise. We are in conversations with American companies now that are either in Venezuela or and so on. And and matter of fact, I want to, uh, he also, uh, not too long ago, made a similar uh, comment about Iran. And yeah, that was quoted in the New York Times in January. After... Uh, the Major General Qasem Soleimani, Soleimani uh, was assassinated, he said the first step to regime change in Tehran has occurred. That's a direct quote from John Bolton. Uh, so I'm coming to close to a conclusion here. Uh, Guado also publicly uh, has uh, outed his commitment to privatize the state-owned uh, Venezuelan oil industry. And this was from a Reuters uh, article uh, dating uh, back in March 12, 2019. And uh, Reuters noted, quote, the proposal could provide ammunition for Maduro's claim that Guado is a puppet for foreign interests. Interesting. When he made, when Guado actually outlined how he would be committed to privatize the oil industry in Venezuela. So 
we we know that not only Iran but also Cuba is probably is on next on the list for regime change. Uh, the fossil empire has long been dying to eliminate the Cuban Revolution, and again, the Cuban Revolution has also blossomed in. Uh, in many respects, in an eco-socialist direction with its uh, very strong conversion to agroecology. So my son Peter and I visited uh, a food first tour on that and in our book, The Earth is Not for Sale. And of course, their uh, shift to cooperative ownership. Now, uh, it's already been mentioned that Iran has the fourth largest oil reserves in the world. Oh, it's 158 billion barrels behind uh, the U.S. allies, Saudi Arabia and Canada. And while Europe has been resisting U.S. pressure to terminate the Iran nuclear deal, and a reprise of the Monroe Doctrine, Europe is still supporting the U.S. regime change agenda with respect to Venezuela. Uh, only a resurgent global movement can back this outcome. And this challenge should be considered by climate and energy justice activists and all those who are supporting a global Green New Deal. Finally, blocking the Trump and potentially Biden's coup against Venezuela would be an important step to undermining the power of the military industrial complex. And as already mentioned, the U.S. military is both the biggest polluter and also the biggest obstacle to freeing up the resources for a robust global Green New Deal and creating a regime global regime of cooperation so necessary to avoid catastrophe, catastrophic climate change in the ever-shrinking time we have left to prevent it. So this is a challenge uh, to the climate and energy justice movement. Connect the dots. And thank you. I think um, I did my 15 minutes. <laughs> and I'm going to mute. Great, thank you so much, David, for that. So now we'll move to the uh, question and answer portion of this webinar. And you can ask questions either using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. So if you're on Zoom, uh, bring your cursor to the bottom of the screen and click on the Q&A and you can write a question there. If you're watching on YouTube or on Facebook, you can ask a question in the comments section. Um, but I have a few questions that have been asked already. And so I'm going to give this question to our panelists and um, kind of put two questions together. One is asking, you know, maybe some concrete information on how to get the climate justice and anti war movements working together. And wondering also if people in the anti-war movement are working with Extinction Rebellion. So does anybody want to take those questions? Go ahead and unmute yourself and speak. Any of our panelists? I can start off. I'm sure others have um, things to add. But I think um, the Just Transition framework that was sort of included at the beginning of my presentation is a good place to start in thinking about how anti-militarism and anti-war movements might work more effectively with climate justice movements. I think um, there's sometimes a missed opportunity at framing the fossil fuel industry within a broader problematic economic system that needs to be restructured. And um, maybe thinking more strategically about sometimes some climate groups are focused pretty narrowly on the fossil fuel industry um, but there's a lot of opportunities to look at the broader economic system um, in which the fossil fuel industry operates. And when you do that, there's very um, obvious ties to militarization. I mean, David was just speaking about the sort of power of the military industrial complex in sort of preventing some of the change that we want to see. Um, there's, of course, the power of the fossil fuel industry in preventing a lot of the change that we want to see. So how can we look at um, both of those sort of empires um, 
as part of this broader system and not as you know isolated powerful entities. So I think sort of this structural framing is, is a good place to start. Great. Anybody else want to take that, Quincy or David? Uh, yeah, I just very briefly. I, I that was a really good a good response, and I I I think that we need to bring this issue to well in the United States, bring it to the public in this election, and that's why I am supporting Howie Hawkins for Green Party for president, because matter of fact, I shared a link to uh, his article that was in Teleser on this very topic. Uh, and we need a voice like Howie to put out, connect the dots and, and have a clear anti-imperialist perspective coupled with an eco-socialist Green New Deal. Uh, and uh, I, I am committed to defeating Trump, but we need a voice to challenge the uh, basically the imperialist discourse that we're going to hear from both sides. And we already witnessed that Biden is attacking Trump from the right, not from the left, from the right on foreign policy. So uh, that's in a short range, I see that as an important uh, uh, initiative that that could uh, further our objective. Great. And if I could just, um, uh, unless Quincy, did you want to add something? Okay. Um, if I could just quickly add, you know, last fall, we actually intentionally tried to do this work through the people's mobilization to stop the wars and save the planet in New York. It happened during the United Nations General Assembly. And it was also a time when there were a lot of climate groups there. There was a climate summit on the Monday, one of the Mondays of that General Assembly. And we held a, a rally and a march. We also went to the climate marches and brought information about the connections between climate and militarism um, and you know, got a lot of kind of messaging out through that. I think that you know, the, the anti-war movement really would do well to partner more with the climate movement because it uh, feels like at this point in time, the climate movement is really doing some great direct action and very strategic actions, which the anti-war movement could benefit from. And at the same time, if we don't address the wars for oil, we're never going to really address the climate crisis. So the climate movement, it, it just feels like a really natural um, inter, you know, connection and intersection that we should be definitely trying to build. And I think uh, the resources from Quincy, Laura, and David are really helpful um, to making those connections. So um, a couple more questions. One person wanted to ask if you could clarify how much oil Venezuela has, is it 180 billion barrels or 180 trillion, um, I think, or 180 million. <laughs> so there's a discrepancy there that needs to be cleared up. And then um, how committed is Venezuela to transitioning rapidly off of fossil fuels? So whoever wants to start with those questions. Uh, I will, I will I'll leave the second part to Quincy. But the first part is I uh, that Venezuela's proven reserves are, are 300 billion barrels. Uh, Iran, I also quoted Iran. I think there was a uh, mixing up uh, between the two. And Iran has something uh, like uh, 148 billion barrels of proven reserves. So that that's the uh, so that's the difference between the two. And the total, the total proven reserves of oil are over 1,000 billion barrels, probably close to 2,000 billion barrels. Most of that has to be left in the ground. Great. Um, Quincy, do you want to answer about Venezuela's? And um, you need to unmute. Oh, you're all unmuted. Go ahead. Sure. Thank you, everybody. Um, I think uh, ever since the Treaty of Westphalia back in 1600s, we speak about nation states as if they were like individuals. So how committed is Venezuela? I think there is a huge uh, range inside Venezuela of how committed people are. You know, there are people that will, you know, get their indigenous peoples that will give up their lives before they give up their ancestral lands. Um, there are people in government who are, you know, absolutely 100 percent committed to 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 the government policy, which is the 2013 plan of the homeland. 
Um, there are also counter revolutionaries in Venezuela. There's also just average people that aren't too involved in these discussions, just like in any country. Um, so I think the real challenge is, um, it's, it's kind of common sense, you can kind of imagine it, like when David and I were doing our best to try to get our proposal for the solarization of Venezuela and, Mel and Mercosur um, into the hands of people at PDVSA and government ministries, um, people are very busy fighting imperialism, because if they lose the election uh, and Guaido is president, then, then your solarization proposal doesn't matter, because they're going to privatize everything. It's like, that'll be the least of our concerns. So I think the biggest thing is, is what David said, is we need to get our foot off their neck uh, so that they can make their own decisions. The best way to empower people in Venezuela who are committed towards the full eco-socialist revolutionary solar transition, um, the best way to help them would be defeating the regime change agenda in the United States. That will free up people in the streets, people in the government, people in the, the, part, in the big party in Venezuela, people in other parties. Um, that would be the best thing we could do. And if I could just also answer briefly the, the previous question, if that's okay. Um, I just think uh, I, I may be wrong. I don't want to step on any toes here. But as somebody who first got involved in politics um, in 2002, three around the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, maybe there's like an elephant in the room here. But as far as I noticed, there is no anti-war movement. Um, you know, there's the same people like the ones you see in this call that are, you know, stalwartly hanging out and doing, you know, doing the good work in a noble way. But guys, we're not doing it. We're, we, we still haven't gotten up to the point that we lost in 2014 with the largest demonstration in the history of the world. Um, it's not there. And the climate justice movement is almost in a similar position. It gets a lot of great publicity sometimes, but I don't always buy the hype. I mean, I'm waiting to see masses of people involved uh, by the millions and billions that, that affect them. Um, so I think a lot of times the problem is the leadership. I think the, the, the people in these movements, especially the young people, it's they, they already knew a long time ago about the connection between uh, climate change and militarism. This is not news. The, the, the problem is, is that the leadership often does not reflect um, the base. And I would suggest, I think, that some of the best leadership for this will come from some of the radical veterans organizations. I would encourage people to support uh, groups like Iraq Veterans Against the War, the Coalition Against Military Bases. They all have very advanced anti-militarist and uh, pro-ecological, eco-socialist politics. So I, I would like to see and I would like to support uh, more of their leadership for both a renewed anti-war movement and a renewed uh, climate justice movement. Great, thank you. Um, so there was another question about why is Venezuela importing oil from Iran? I can answer that unless you wanna take that one. No, no, please go ahead, okay. go ahead. Um, so Venezuela has a type of oil that has to be diluted with other oil to, um, to be able to refine it. It's a very thick oil and it typically Venezuela would buy that from the United States. So I believe some of the oil may be used for that, but also uh, Venezuela is down to basically one functioning refinery because part because of the economic coercive measures imposed by the United States, they're not able to buy parts to repair basic infrastructure like to keep their refineries running. So on those tankers are also equipment to help rebuild their refineries and some of that equipment comes from China. The United States recently blacklisted the corporation that made that equipment that's traveling on those Iranian boats um, just because we have to punish everybody. Um, so they are really facing a cruel, uh, fuel crisis right now and need that oil to come in from Iran. Um, another couple of questions, one has to do with uh, China. Uh, what role does do China's efforts to move from coal coal to solar power play in all of this. And also a question about, um, you know, energy is also required for transportation. And right now that requires extraction, like to bake uh, batteries for electric cars. So how much extraction is going to be required to make this transition to a renewable energy economy? So whoever wants to take those about China moving from coal to solar and how much extraction is required for renewable. Um, if can I can I start and then turn it over to David? Sure, or Laura, whoever wants to take it. Yep. Yeah, I just want to maybe give David an introduction because I think um, he's the best person in the world uh, to answer both of these. Well, maybe not, but it's particularly the second question. Um, you know, for many years, myself included, we've been shouting, you know, uh, no war, no warming. You know, use the military to budget to build solar panels. 
but we don't always have the numbers to prove that it can be done. Uh, but David, for years, has been crunching these numbers. So exactly how much oil do we need to use so that we can stop using oil? How much coal uh, can we burn while staying under a 1.5 degree warming thing as per Paris and Cochabamba, um, but also lift people out of energy poverty? Um, how can we do all these things simultaneously? You can't just uh, have a rhetorical answer to these. You need a scientific answer based on you know crunching those numbers. Um, and the good news is that it's possible still. Uh, if more people would listen to folks like David, especially in government, the world would be in a different place. And um, you know, I don't speak Chinese, have never been to China, but I've followed. David has been there several times, and I believe he, you know, he. I, I want him to comment on this, but because I think that this is China is really um, another country like Venezuela, which could prove to be a global tipping point. And um, the anti-Chinese, you know, uh, racism, which we're seeing is taking us in exactly the opposite direction from the one we need to be going into, because China could be one of our uh, most hopes, our greatest hopes, even while it also poses maybe the greatest danger. Um, so uh, I'd like to just preface David in that way. I saying I think he's one of the most important voices in the world on this subject. Well, I don't know about that, Quincy, but <laughs> I'll do my best. Uh I, in our book, The Earth is Not for Sale, we did uh, an in-depth uh, look at this, these issues. Uh, I'm a scientist, so is my oldest son, Peter Schwartzman, and we really uh, try to back this up. So first, I'll actually start out with China, and then I'll get a little into the extraction challenge, uh, which is real. Uh, China can lead the world. And we certainly should recognize its role in uh, opposing regime change in Venezuela. Uh, uh, and uh, Russia is too. And they, uh, now there are a lot of contradictions going on, but uh, that is a positive uh, policy of China and Russia regarding this regime. They're opposing the regime change agenda. And you could just uh, read about this in the recent debate in the uh, Security Council that was highlighted in Telesar. Uh, I will share a link to a piece I did uh, on China, a fairly recent piece that was published in Climate and Capitalism. But uh, let me uh, just emphasize there are a lot of contradictions going on. And just as uh, Venezuela, is prevented from really using uh, its oil to do away with oil. So China is also in the global economy uh, challenged by a lot of uh, pressure and is not um, transitioning as rapidly as it could to, away from coal to renewable. Uh, it is the world's leader in building renewable technology, by the way, and that should be recognized. Uh, uh, but I have very uh, high hopes for the people of China, and I, I think that China could potentially be leading the whole world to an eco-socialist uh, future. I really, I really believe that. Now, if just a little about the extraction issue, uh, it is real. And uh, it, we, it has to be taken seriously. Uh, commonly, people refer to uh, lithium, for instance, using in batteries. And we know lithium is a relatively rare element, and uh, Bolivia is a major producer. And, again, uh, and another element, a rare earth, neodymium, which uh, China is a, a big producer, and it's mined there. Uh, However, we should uh, uh, take a serious look at two developments that I think will make it easier to shut down mining in a big way in the world, in the, in the not distant future. And that will be, number one, by as the wind and solar capacity in the world grows, it then we can recycle these rarer elements without having to mine them. And neodymium is a prime example. A uh, very little of it is being recycled now. Secondly, the technologies that rely on the rare elements 
uh, can be replaced by more common elements uh, like sodium sulfur batteries are being actually being used now. And uh, 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 and there is research and development in that area. So uh, both the combined um, uh, um, uh, developments I'm speaking of, I think, uh, doesn't guarantee that extraction will not be a problem. Again, it, it we need a transnational movement to challenge first of all green capital which is the reality now and and make this transition possible it's we cannot rely on green capital to deliver uh the future for us we have to challenge it at every point and then open up the possibility that we no longer have to rely on green capital because then we have an eco-socialist transition and basically a bottom-up um, struggle, a bottom-up process from all over the world could actually take over and manage this transition. Uh, so that, that, in a nutshell, is uh, um, <laughs> my response. And I, I hope Laura had, because Laura mentioned the extraction uh, and I hope she uh, responds as well on this. Can you, do you have anything you want to add, Laura? Sure. I mean, I'll just say quickly, I think, um, to give time for other questions. Um, I think those are really good points. And I think it just gestures towards the importance of structuring our conversations around the Green New Deal um, as a global Green New Deal, um, especially for those of us who's you know, objectives are justice. Um, this is a global issue. And with issues related to extraction, mining, the resources that are required to um, have a Green New Deal, we really need it to be a global conversation. Great, thank you. Um, there's another question about uh, using GDP, moving away from using GDP or gross domestic product as a measure for countries. And I know I read just recently that China is talking about moving away from that and focusing more on welfare of, uh, of the country as a, as a whole um, in terms of measuring their progress. Someone asked about extraction of being linked to the coup in Bolivia. And I know that Evo Morales nationalized the mining, I believe, and wanted to have Bolivia use its own resources. They have a lot of resources of lithium so that lit uh, Bolivia could be producing the batteries and things and not allowing outside corporations to just come in and mine it. So I think there's a big connection there. Um, let's see, one person is asking, do you agree the abolishment of incarceration is another movement to join the peace and climate movement? And let's see. Um, that's yeah. So yeah, I'll that's, just say really quickly yeah. on, on that last front. Um, I think yes. And I, I think some of the work that we're doing at NPP is really looking to frame uh, militarization as encompassing more than just the Pentagon and looking at connections between, um, you know, military funding, but also militarized policing, uh, militarized immigration enforcement, um, incarceration. And so I think, again, it's critical that we sort of broaden our framework in having these discussions. Great. Um, and then the last two questions. Um, one is, why isn't there any progress being made in getting European countries to break with the United States, especially with regards to Iran and Venezuela and supporting Guaido in Venezuela? And um, the last question is about kind of getting broader coalitions to uh, kind of join into the anti-war pro, you know, addressing the climate movement. So who would like to take either of those or both? Quincy, oh, let me unmute you, hold on. Okay, sure. go ahead. yeah. I'll, I'll give it a shot. There's a lot of important questions there. Um, on the question of GDP, I'll try to address all the things you mentioned. On the question of GDP, um, one of the one of the advantages of being in a global pandemic is that the whole human condition is once again up for conversation. Um, so this this thing, which might have been an abstract conversation 
five months ago about should we measure, measure GDP another way. Uh, now we all have really concrete example about how the, the way we measure our well-being is actually in direct contradiction with our well-being. Um, and this is increasingly obvious, not just to intellectuals or activists, but to like the common woman or man on the street. Um, and these are this is the, the the place where revolutionary organizing can really get started. And there's lots of exciting experiments around the world. You know, Bhutan measures gross national happiness. Um, there's there's a lot. There's the genuine progress indicator, which factors out environmental externalities. So there's all kinds of ways we could be experimenting with how we measure our well-being, how we val how, how we measure value. You know, moving away from fiat currencies and towards other forms of local solidarity economies. You know, there's all kinds of um, ideas on the table now, and we need to accelerate that. Um, about abolishing incarceration, I don't know who asked that question, but thank you so much. Uh, this is just such an important thing for all of us. Uh, we don't talk about it nearly enough, but whatever your form of activism, if you not, if you don't make it your business uh, to take care of the people that are behind bars, uh, you're setting yourself up for a bad scene because one day you might wind up incarcerated for that your actions, and then you know you're not going to have a movement. Um, so that's something that I've focused a lot on is trying to build the movement to free political prisoners in the United States. Um, part of the eco-socialist, first eco-socialist international plan of action is um, the freeing of uh, political prisoners. And I think, you know, the abolition of uh, the whole the whole spectrum of incarceration. Um, suddenly, and again, that was something that was I've been talking about for years. Many people have been talking about it for decades. And um, suddenly it's on the table now that we have COVID pandemic. Um, it's suddenly it's the only medical just thing to do is to open up the prisons. Um, so we have to push harder and harder and harder on these on these fronts um, about Bolivia. Uh, this is such an important question. Um, you know, what's happening in Bolivia is very scary. Um, the response of the international community, if we can call it that, is even scarier. Um, I mean, if folks haven't uh, looked closely at this woman who now has declared herself president of Bolivia, um, it makes, you know, Guaido look OK. I mean, this, this is like the return of the conquest, openly racist, um, kind of uh, swearing in on the Bible, uh, dragging the opposition naked through the streets. I mean, it's, it's really um, quite terrifying what's happening in Bolivia. It's an extreme right wing uh, government right now. And we should all follow the elections there very closely because we know that the CIA was involved in uh, meddling with their last election. And we know they'll be involved in the next one. Um, and if we're going to think long term about this as well, remember that Bolivia is the altiplano of all South America. So they give fresh water to the, all the other countries in South America. So any kind of nasty extraction regime that gets set up there, you know, refining batteries or whatever they're doing, uh, that will affect over centuries to come um, all the countries of Latin America as that fresh water flows downhill. Um, uh, and obviously, and needless to say, there is lots of inspiration to be found in the history of Bolivia and the president of Boliv and the present of Bolivia. Not just Evo at all. It's this long historical process that uh, we should all study more about. It's sort of one of the uh, great success stories in the world, uh, which resulted in the first indigenous head of state um, in the in the hemisphere. Um, lastly, on the EU. Um, I think um, I don't have any special insight on this, but I could just reflect that the EU has become a, a colony, basically, of the U.S. Federal Reserve banking system. Um, people of the European Union have lost their sovereignty. Uh, the Brussels makes the decision about what governments can and can't spend. Um, and they, they're really caught uh, in a really difficult place right now. The fact that the German finance minister committed suicide a few weeks ago doesn't bode well for the future of the EU. Um, and uh, we really, really hope uh, that along with the people in the United States, that the people in the EU will awaken and better control the people that govern them and, uh, you know, reflect the, the positive, the, the liberatory, the, the good side of their history. Um, so, yeah, come. We hope that Americans and Europeans can uh, join the rest of the human race uh, and not just continue to be parasites on the super profits of the of the Africa, Asia and Latin America. Thank you. Excellent, uh, Quincy. And we've actually come to the end of our 90 minutes. So oh, sorry. Uh, no, sorry. that was excellent. Um, I, I don't want to stop without uh, giving some acknowledgement to Julian Assange. Somebody raised this earlier. And of course, uh, if we don't have knowledge and information, we don't have power. 
And so WikiLeaks and what Julian Assange built uh, is critically important. And the message that his, uh, his prosecution sends to the world in terms of we can go after you wherever you are if you challenge US hegemony and militarism um, is something that we need to make sure that we don't allow that to happen. So he's facing trial this fall and uh, people are organizing around that. Of course, we'll post that on Popular Resistance. So I wanna thank everybody, our panelists today for spending your time and, and sharing your wisdom with us. I wanna thank all of our participants today for also taking time on, um, on a Saturday afternoon to talk about these issues. And we will post this on Popular Resistance along with the links to the PowerPoints if anybody wants to download those. I think they're excellent, especially uh, Laura, your PowerPoint uh, to bring to groups, to climate and, and anti-war groups as a presentation um, in, with the primer. It's just such an important tool for building this movement. So um, that's all. And I want to thank everybody for being here today. So thank you. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Uh, great time. All right. <laughs> thanks, everybody. Thanks, David. Thanks, guys. Okay.